but exciting talk um, as on the screen there um, around track buckles, risk and detection. Uh, and we've, we're very lucky to have Jonathan, Richard and John on today to present. Um, as I said, if you put questions in the chat and or put hands up at the end, we'll um, we'll we'll bring you in as normal. Uh, and if you're not presenting, if you put your camera and uh, microphone on mute. So to further ado, um, over to you guys. Thanks, Ian. Uh, thank you very much for having us today. So just very quick introduction. So um, myself, I'm Jonathan Smith, project manager within uh, the research and development program in the technical authority in Network Rail. I've got Richard with me and John. Rich, if you'd like to um, introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. So my name's Rich Gibson. Um, uh, I'm principal engineer in the chat frameworks and assurance team, the TA. Um, my background has uh, been on a railway since 2002. So uh, just shy of 20 years, so that was in maintenance, uh, over 10 years as a TME. So I've had my fair share of buckles. And um, then I've been in the TA for a couple of years now. Hi, I'm John Lawrence, uh, these days consultant, but previously Network Rail um, and Atkins, done a lot of uh, safety related innovation. Uh, been around the piece quite a bit in most different departments, um, but generally got quite a bit of experience of uh, getting things through um, innovation wise, safety related. Thanks, gents. Um, so then just very quick introduction to the project. Um, we picked this up um, last year, uh, the group of us and uh, it's around remote condition monitoring for track buckles and risk detection. So um, it's it's kind of as it says on the tin. So I'll pass through to Rich, just give you a bit of background uh, around the project now. Go, yeah, Rich. Lovely, thanks, Johnny. So um, yeah, a little bit of background on um, why this project um, has has come into play, um, and a, a bit of a a bit of background into the size of the issue, really. So. In, um, you can see on the right hand side there, there's a, there's a map and that is uh, demonstrating uh, the amount of CRT sites for watch persons that we had across the network um, in summer of 2022, uh, where we had a CRT watch person of 54 degrees or below. Um, so by region, you see there's quite a large number there, adding up to over 14,000 sites. Um, so a kind of a problem statement, uh, so during the calendar year of 2020, uh, we had over 1600 standard jobs were raised across the country for deployment of track watch persons for undertaking hot weather duties. Um, so this totaled uh, nearly 24,000 hours of planned inspection time. Um, and like I've just said, we had uh, 14,700 odd uh, CRT sites. Uh, of 54 degrees C or below for a watch person in 2022. Um, so our issues we've got for the problem statement is uh, network rail, we've got reduced access now and reduced resources to carry out the CRT watch person duties. Um, our current process of how we manage uh, these sites is with watch persons is no longer viable. It's not a viable option anymore. And current processes are also open to human error um, and it's difficult for our watch persons to monitor long CRT sites where you might need multiple uh, multiple staff on a single CRT site. Um, and then uh, the way that things are going uh, with climate change and um, track buckles, the, the risk is just likely to become um, bigger and bigger um, as the years go on. So kind of split into two, we've got the short term solution um, and that is to automate the watch person duties uh, by providing a system that allows a single watch person to manage multiple CRT sites at once. And that's at the stage we're on now. And then the longer term solution is to replace a watch person's role uh, with condition monitoring and actually removing boots on ballast uh, to buy incorporating automated speedboards, ETCS, etc., uh, to manage the speeds. Thanks, Rich. I'll move us on to the next slide. OK, so a little, little bit about uh, what we do at present. Um, so uh, managing track and hot weather standard, that's NIL2 TRK001 module 14. Um, and the uh, 
the role of a watch person, as stated in there in Table 10, um, so it is as follows. An effective watch person can continuously observe sites and traffic for the potential or presence of a buckle taking place. And that's from a vantage point or a platform, safe sets or similar, and observing track and train interaction, or can have a line blockage after each train for assessment. A watch person can report rail temperatures, reflective of site specific conditions, and also implement the ESRs when the thresholds are reached. And then we look at the challenges of a watch person role. So it's not viable to deploy the number of watch persons uh, we, we need for the quantity of CRT sites we have each summer. Um, in particular, long sites that require multiple watch persons. Um, this is even more challenging uh, now with the uh, modernising maintenance changes that have just taken place and in the process of taking place. Uh, we've got limited options for access to CRT sites following the removal of red zone working now and also the increase in the number of trains running on the network also has a massive impact on that. And then the identification of track buckles, it's subjective. It relies on a watch person being in the right place at the right time uh, in order to identify when a buckle appears. And then finally on there, we've got with the current process, it's difficult to provide suitable welfare for our watch persons. Um, there's a significant chance of heat, ex heat exhaustion and sunstroke and, and all the other risks which are associated with lone working on the railway. Johnny's kindly put a nice couple of pictures on there. Um, the one on the left is a, an example of me doing a very good watch person <laughs> uh, inspection. And um, the other two photos at the top there, uh, which we're going to go on to later on, I think, but they're basically at Tuxford where we uh, we induce track buckles to to actually uh, test some of the uh, technologies. All Thanks, yours, Thank you. Thank um, you. So moving us on, so from Richard there, he's really kind of framed the background um, information and kind of the, the picture of the scope of the project and the, the issues we we're trying to solve. So um, the R&D project was born and um, it was with the vision of, uh, we, we, we had a name for the project, was to develop and demonstrate a range uh, of these technologies, so remote condition monitoring systems that either combined or as a single system could eliminate the need for a watch person to enter the live railway. Um, so th that's what we were really after. So to date, since last year when we came together uh, as a project team, uh, we developed the technical specification um, for what would be needed for remotely monitoring uh, these critical rail temperature sites. We then engaged the market via a PIN, PIN's a prior information notice, um, and that was to review just existing knowledge and technology capabilities that were in the marketplace and see if the marketplace would be um, able to technically meet the specification that we put out. Um, it turned out that there was a lot of response to that, so we were very gladly moved forward and we launched a procurement design competition. Um, and that contest, uh, we utilised a lot of internal NR uh, engineering resource to evaluate the bids and select the final technologies that we would take forward uh, to award contract to in trial. Um, so once we got into the position where we'd award contracts, we knew we would need to um, create ourselves uh, a way to buckle track, but also we came uh, with the issue of having to do that in a consistent and reproducible manner. And that'll be talked more about by John in uh, a slide in a, in a few minutes time. But uh, we essentially is a very high level of it. We developed, designed and then awarded contract for the build of a test rig um, that then supported the suppliers technology uh, trials that we conducted at Tuxford. Um, it was all done in a controlled environment. Um, so then following that, we had to um, set up our uh, our de the development of our um, trial testing and success criteria. Um, we needed this so we could um, achieve evidence for what we'd need for each of these technologies to be taken forward for product acceptance and also proving their design for reliability requirements. Um, and then we uh, were working all the way through. We made this as collaborative uh, as possible as, as we could with each of the suppliers we had awarded contracts to. And we said um, from kind of the every kickoff meeting we had with the six suppliers, 
this is a very open book piece. Uh, our knowledge is your knowledge and shared. So worked really collaboratively with all six of them. Uh, we were dotted all around the country, uh, going on site visits to meet with each of the suppliers, conduct bench testing uh, first and foremost with them of their technology. So we knew when we got them over to Tuxford that they were coming with a solution that would be ready to be trialled. Um, and then secondly, uh, just lending our knowledge, it was it was almost used as active requirements capture as um, we took the likes of Rich as he introduced himself and he said he's 20 years nearly on the railway, that, that kind of knowledge the suppliers don't have. And the beauty of the design contest meant that we had suppliers come in who were outside the railway environment that brought a slightly more diverse way of thinking about the problem statement. So really lending Rich's experience, other NR uh, engineers experience um, to collaboratively develop their uh, their technologies. And then finally, the last thing we've done to date so far is conduct, is conduct those controlled uh, tests uh, at RIDC, so the Rail Innovation and Development Centre at Tuxford. Um, and that was completed in August. Um, and really, there was a few things driving that. We had a very short time frame for the project to get demonstrations done um, as the ORR following the 2021 summer, uh, sorry, the 2022 summer, had um, uh, it put a notice to uh, John Edgeley, uh, who's the head of uh, track and switch and crossings in Network Rail, um, to uh, to say how we're going to demonstrate of what we're going to do in the future using research and development to uh, monitor our CRT sites, because as Rich said, the problem's only going to get bigger and bigger. Um, so the, the the main th there's the real kind of bulk of the project, the, the vision there, the expected benefits that we're looking at. It's almost the opposite of the challenges of what Richard stated uh, already, but it's reducing boots on ballast. So it, not having the need for the watch person at those individual CRT sites. Um, it's it's improving track worker safety, um, the ability to have one track worker uh, be able to monitor multiple CRT sites from a position of safety, potentially in a van. Um, and then the, in, there's going to be the reduction in unnecessary speed restrictions being put on. Um, <coughs> if there's not the watch persons available to go to site, if we can deploy technology to do that job. We're not going to have to put ratchet speed restrictions on. And then finally, there's the removal of the human error uh, of monitoring for track buckles. So it's improving the accuracy and the, uh, the confidence in uh, where track buckles are being identified and reported. Um, so just move us on. Um, I, I I won't talk too much in particular about the suppliers technologies because we don't want to run into uh, like an IPR issue. Um, it, it is the suppliers technologies? Yes, they worked with us, but they own the IPR to their technology. But broadly, uh, you can see the suppliers we've awarded contract to. So RailSense, Yeltec, Wise and University of Leeds um, our, and DS RailTech. Um, they broadly fit into three categories um, of how their technology solution works. So I'll just move them to where they sit. Um, there's a piezoelectric vibration measurement system. There's laser distance and deviation measurement. And then finally, there's radar measurement. And they're kind of the core themes of how they completed, um, how they conducted their measurement. And we demonstrated them um, at Tuxford. So there's kind of a picture of how some of those technologies look, aligning to whose they are. Um, I'll move us forward to John and John, if you can just talk to us about the testing we've done, the um, well, the accelerated testing we've done, how it's benefited us and uh, how we ended up with the rig and the position it, it, it was at the end of uh, at the end of testing. No problem. So just to drop us back a little then, um, covering some of the things that Johnny said there, um, obviously we've got a need to uh, um, to get something going. It's, it's a safety critical task. Uh, but also, I mean, those among us we can tell we can't go around creating track buckles all over the place to be able to test this stuff. Um, so it's really quite challenging to get something that's going to be representative um, and to be able to give us a, a, a sort of proper workout for the technology. Now, uh, the key to this is obviously starting with the end in mind. So we've we've set the bar really high to start with in terms of what we've done. We've we've set off with PA VFR requirements, working through the rival stages as quick as we can right from the get go on this. Um, so we haven't um, engaged in anything that we might consider playtime or anything of that nature. It's all been straight onto it to make sure that every, I suppose every day spent, every every task spent, generates some evidence that can uh, that can be used. Now, critical to this obviously is we want some repeatable and reproducible way to create trap buckles 
that will test the characteristics of the devices that we've had put in front of us. So the starting point of that was obviously to, to assess the technology, to assess the type of technology, to get underneath the bonnet with the technology to see what sort of characteristics we were dealing with with that to understand um, really what we needed to do to work it out. And then the other piece of so in creating the test rig, we wanted to create minimum viable product. So we didn't want to sort of create something that we're all singing and all dancing. We, we really restricted ourselves down to a requirements based system that delivered precisely what we needed to do when we needed to do it. So the process we went through, as I said, we, we assessed each um, candidate technology. We, we, we deconstructed it. We understood the characteristics, the principles of it, brought that into requirements. We then put a group of experienced track engineers together, Rich, um, Brian, Andy, various others, um, and we all got together and, and developed concepts in and around what we wanted to do to uh, to deliver. And we refined those concepts one by one. Uh, we went through various different design iterations that you can see on the left hand side. And we, we finalized on the test rig that you can see on the bottom and the right hand side there. And the characteristics of the rig, are it gives us an ability to um, to, to set multiple different types of buckle. And the idea being as a primary requirement is to perform a gauge R and R study. That's a key requirement for design for reliability. And it's a key characteristic of being able to sort of demonstrate a safety argument using this sort of technology. So whatever we're testing has got to be reproducible and uh, repeatable in its ability to deliver. Now the other part of this is, is obviously how we got there. We did the bench testing. We got the suppliers in the frame of mind of what a gauge r and our study looked like. Um, but we also looked at how we might sort of create practical situations around that as well. So going back to the spec that uh, the Rich and Co put together, we, we created a, a, a test rig that gave us the ability to create multiple different uh, amplitude buckles, uh, but also to control that and also to automate that if, uh, if required. So the idea being is, that uh, we set different um, size buckles and we worked through a process for the gauge r and three different operators, 10 different measurements, do that three times. That gives us a DFR requirement, but it also allowed us to get hands on with the technology as well. So as Rich, um, and sorry, as, as Johnny said earlier, this has been very collaborative and very forward in the way we've gone about things and extremely open. Um, so the, the ability of this, has been able to get us hands on to be able to explore different aspects of the design and to make sure that each individual vendor has had the ability to benefit from experience both from you know what the track engineers brought to it but also get hands on in what is a realistic environment for them so the rig itself like i say it allows us to put um specified book it allows us to automate that. It allows us to move backwards and forwards. Um, and if we need to, we, in the future, it's been designed to allow us to do calibration, but also um, sort of longer term accelerated testing as well. So we can program the, uh, the the unit to put trap buckles on and do that multiple times over a longer period of time. So we're in a situation where um, it's allowed us to drive forward massively in terms of the, the design concepts that people have brought. So from the first bench test, we uh, we set various um, tests for them, went through a gauge study on the first bench tests. The teams came back then with refined technology and refined processes, came back onto the test rig, tested it under live buckle conditions. Um, and pretty much all of them came and they all of them got through a gauge study. Um, quite a lot of lessons learned about sort of practical prototyping that's going to move forward um, much quicker as well. And then following that, we took it from the test rig and we took it out at Tuxford onto the live environment where we set some track buckles on the, the sort of dead end of bit of the track. Uh, but we also took them through um, all sorts of, sort of practical scenarios, S and C can curves, the subside to get, get hands on, understand the practical aspects of what they need to do to be able to uh, to pass the requirements. And uh, that's pretty much where we are now. Go to Johnny. Thanks, John. Um, so just moving us on to kind of where, where we've come to, um, as I've talked on the project, the uh, the progress today, and then where we're kind of expected to get to next. Um, so following the Tuxford uh, testing trials that we did, uh, we 
We've been receiving um, testing reports from each of the suppliers, documenting everything they've learned to date, giving demonstrable evidence to the um, rural level or TRL level that they've uh, got their technology up to and achieved, but then also started to demonstrate uh, how they're meeting um, DFR and PA requirements. Um, so at the moment we're reviewing them, we'll be in a position where we'll look to select uh, a number of the six. It's not confirmed how many yet. Um, but a number of the six that we'll take forward and we're looking to then move to uh, operational um, environment, sorry, operational environment uh, trials. So getting the technology on the live railway, uh, finding out how uh, lasers react to three months worth of brake dust uh, uh, on them. Um, the railway is not a, a perfect environment, really getting that environmental testing layer uh, into the technologies. But then um, also gathering the rest of our, um, our product acceptance requirements, whether that's through lab, other lab based testing or a return to the test rig at Tuxford um, to ultimately get product acceptance by we're aiming for March. Um, as we would like to have um, some of these technologies ready for deployment in summer next year to help us manage our critical rail temperature sites, as Richard has um, spoken through the uh, size of the issue we've got to manage um, every summer. So that's that's kind of the schedule of it, where we're going next with the project. Um, just thank you again for uh, the time for having us on, and then um, we are uh, sort of welcome to any questions um if there is anything that comes up after the session that you think back on the slides will be shared with uh, pwi and our email addresses are there so feel free to contact us but have open to questions now lovely so if you just want to put your hands up um i'll invite you in uh in order and or you could put a chat in the in the uh, a question in the chat even Okay, we've got first uh, question is from Roger. Go ahead, Roger. Um, yes, I think I've got some sound. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you thought at all about rail stress in terms of uh, transducers or something like that to to measure the stress in the rail to note note any sudden changes. I mean, it seems to me that vibration is possibly a bad thing to be measuring because trains vibrate and also buckles can ha can occur underneath trains and you, you may well find that uh, the vibration system doesn't work very well. Have you considered transducers, basically? I'll, uh, I'll start on that one then. So we... Um... We basically we couldn't uh, dictate what type of technology we wanted um, because of the way our hands were tied with the contest and uh, we had to let those technologies come to us. The one which has got the piezo vibration, uh, piezoelectric vibrations, it, um, it not only measures uh, vibration, as you say, so it will definitely understand when a train goes over, but it's phased in a way that it'll actually measure the distance between um, the, uh, the transducer and the transceiver. Um, and that, that way it will actually measure the length of the rail. So when it buckles, the rail will extend in length. Um, and it, so it, it has that, but also it, it can detect the type of stresses uh, within the rail as well and a change in that from before and after the train. Um, Johnny, jump in if you need to, because I'm just conscious that I can't I can't go into too much detail detail about the actual um, uh, technologies. But it, yeah, it's not just about measuring the vibration of something mo of a of a track moving under a buckle. Uh, but with regards to the um, the initial question, we we didn't really have any say over what type of um, technologies came to us. The um, that the process of choosing the the final six um, from the contest uh, was uh, a case of having a jury of four members, and the the, the entries came into the four jury members. Who was uh, myself, was a Tierney from Southern, and then there was Brian and um, Andy Franklin as well. Uh, we were not allowed to we were not allowed to know which companies um, were presenting. They had to be anonymized. And it was all basically done on the the merits to to score it on a set scoring system. It was it was very strict, and basically we had no no control over the technologies that came to us. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, thanks very much. 
Thanks, Roger. Uh, Lawrence got a question. Uh, hello. So thank you for the presentation. At Cranfield University, we've been working on robots for autonomous rail inspection. Uh, my question is, uh, with the solutions you're engaging with, what, what platforms are they going to be mounted on when you're looking to implement real implementation? Will they, will they be mounted on the, on trains? No. So part of the specification, the initial specification, um, was that uh, we wouldn't have any train-borne solutions. And the reason being that uh, there were far too many trains to fit them on, and this has to be a, uh, this has to be um, a, a system that is going to work everywhere. Um, so, and and as we know, uh, buckles very often happen either immediately after or under trains, and um, so uh, if you have um, a number of trains going over and some of them don't have the technology, then we we haven't got a robust solution. So it's all, all of the um, solutions are either um, mounted to the actual rails or um, mounted in the CES on some type of ballast basket, similar to what you'll have your link lights on, um, on renewal sites and that kind of thing. So, so we've we've gone through the um, the stages of uh, them. Want initially, some of them wanted to be using metal spikes and that kind of stuff, but because of the the way that we have to implement this equipment um, uh, and, it's, and it and it could be on for three days, could be on for five days um, and it could need to go on tomorrow. So buried services, ser searches and that kind of thing are, are not practical um, to be hammering anything into the ground. So it, it's either uh, generally attached to the rail magnetically um, or it's uh, it's actually set in assess on some type of uh, ballast basket stand. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Um, we got a question in the chat um, from I just pushed the wrong button from um, Andrew, uh, which is about: Is there any um, complementary opportunities around uh, video monitoring, maybe forward facing with some a AI? Any thoughts um, on that? So uh, there are there's a couple of um, potential other options which um, aren't covered in this in this contest. Um, and, and one of those is um, not necessarily forward facing, but rear facing, like rear cab um, sort of technologies. Um, they don't come into this contest or this project, um, but there are there are thoughts that um, the likes of Ava technology in a rear cab could be a good solution, especially bearing in mind that buckles often occur under or immediately after trains. So. Yeah, that it has been. Um, it's kind of been aired out there, but there's nothing currently working. Uh, there's nothing currently um, going through the process of any sort of development in that area. Thanks. We got another question from Roger. Well, the only thing I, the other thing I have to say is just how in how far apart are these monitoring systems? I mean, some of these things sound as though they're only going to work over very limited distances. Do you have to put them? Do you have to put them very close together or not? So, but it, no, I, I hadn't actually asked the question or thought of the question just yet, but I, I, that was one thing that was going through my mind, uh, and I haven't put my hand down, obviously, <laughs> which I was doing. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll answer that one anyway, then, Roger. So. Um, some of the solutions, um, uh, the piezoelectric, that can be over a long length. I think we were talking up to 250 metres. Um, and if you need, if you have sites um, such as tamping sites or ballast efficient sites, which are longer than that, then um, you can put them in series and the likes as well. Um, for the, the smaller sites, as, I mean, we don't have uh, out of a solution. There isn't a one size fits all. Um, so just to make that clear to start with the um, but the other solutions, um, laser ones, uh, some of them will actually cover um, up to, say, six metres per unit. Um, we've we've gone with um, the, the, we've gone with our data at previous buckles from our buckle report forms and uh, from a, a graph of a spread graph of the um, the amplitudes and um, and the wavelengths of buckles. Um, the smallest half wavelength, believe it or not, is two meters. 
um, which was a bit of a surprise to me as well, um, and, and a small amplitude mind, uh, but would affect it. It would um, it would affect um, high speed traffic. So we've had to go with the worst case scenario from our data, um, and anything that um, uh, anything that is uh, of a limited spread of what it'll detect, um, it's going to need multiple units. And to cover that. So areas where you've got a, a specific um, risk around SNC, for example, like toe to toe or or in the moving part, the um, the the planed area of the, the switches, that kind of stuff, where you've got high risk or you've got a, a you know a, a classic trigger area. Um, then these some of these solutions are going to be spot on because that's it's that's all we need is a very small area that we're watching. And um, other solutions. Um, uh, other situations, sorry, where you've got a much longer site um, may need multiple of these units or go with a piezo. Very good, thank you. Thanks, Roger. Quick thinking on the uh, on the second question there as well. Well done. Um, just uh, had a question in. Um, uh, does the age of the rail type condition, uh, sorry, environmental conditions affect results? So we've um, with the technologies, um, the the age of the rail um, doesn't. We've we put in a specification that we needed it to be uh, effective on all rail sections um, and plain line S and C, uh, you know, so bullet, flat bottom, um, and and the variety of sleepers, bearers, and that kind of thing. So, um, the the actual age of the rail won't affect it. Um, the conditions, environmental conditions could possibly affect some of them. So um, the um, I think we were we've discussed early stages and, and jump in John if or or Johnny, but uh, we discussed early stages about rain, about dust, about fog um, and the, the type of environmental conditions it could affect um, laser radar. Um, but what the um, the kind of answers we're getting from the manufacturers is that in in the situations we'll be working in, they shouldn't affect it. And if if you bear in mind what we're actually looking for, um, it's going to be hot generally, and it's not going to be hammering down with rain uh, and that kind of stuff. So weather wise, um, it shouldn't affect any. None of the technology should be affected. You look like you're going to say something, John. I just, yeah, just I mean, it's critical to this that we've we've thought about practical process. So all these manufacturers will still have to meet the requirements of 50125-3. That's that's a given. Um, but we've overlaid that with a real thorough assessment or application. So we're not going to try and create something that will work in driving rain and, and two foot of snow because obviously it's not application related. Um, but we have spent quite a bit of time looking at process. Uh, because there are quite a few, few other risks associated with technology in the end-to-end -end process. So it's not just environment, it's environment plus process. And we've spent quite a bit of time working through that, the practical elements of that, and they've gone into requirements. So I think we're reasonably confident on, on to the fact that we've got the right requirements and the, the processes that we're following from a testing point of view, from the results we're expecting, uh, should reflect that. There's, there will be further testing going on as well. Um, uh, I think the next the next level is looking at putting it, and I think we're looking at Melton, aren't we, to have a, a live railway environment. Um, so there'll be further testing uh, going ahead as well, rather than just the, the the kind of closed environment that we've looked at. So it will open up to more environments and a more realistic um, set of parameters. Yeah. Great, I can't see any more hands and I can't see any more questions in the chat. So that takes us to the sort of uh, part of the meeting where I say thanks for the really informative talk. Um, really, really looks like you're stretching the supply chain and using the supply chain really well um, uh, through through our procurement process, but also looks like the supply chain are really engaged and want to want to be want to be part of it and the the test rig looks quite impressive um bit of kit and uh, how it how it all works so um i think if uh, if everybody could join me in um in uh, thanking the uh, three three presenters in the in the usual way thank you very much pleasure
Cheers, guys. Thank you. Your hands Thank are you. up. Thank you very much. And uh, for the yeah, for the PWI attendees, we will be back uh, second Thursday of the month next month as well. Great. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.